Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I guess the um, title of today's section or session should be uh, misinformation. We're going to cover two topics in which misinformation is quite common and the first one has to do with antioxidants and chemotherapy. Um, and I'll just start by saying I have a lot of empathy for cancer patients. They're most likely to receive inaccurate information about treatment and diet and health related issues. And many cancer patients really can't afford to make a single bad decision if they're going to survive their ordeal. And so it makes them particularly vulnerable to bad advice. And then it gets compounded by well-meaning family and friends who often encourage cancer patients, listen to your doctor, your doctor knows best. And of course, I can understand how somebody might think the oncologist knows best how to treat cancer, but you know, it's not always the case. And one ongoing topic of misunderstanding that I want to talk about today is this issue of antioxidants in cancer treatment. Patients are told not to take antioxidant pills, and some are even instructed to avoid high antioxidant foods. And the rationale, what these doctors keep telling patients, is that the antioxidants will interfere with chemotherapy. Research shows otherwise, and I've covered this issue before, and in fact, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ralph Moss, wrote a book called Antioxidants in Chemotherapy, where he reviewed all of the uh, medical literature on this topic and determined that there is no reason to avoid antioxidants during chemotherapy. In fact, it's the opposite. You should encourage more antioxidant intake during chemotherapy. Well, the most recent study that I read it was done at Harvard. It showed that uh, antioxidant supplements don't increase the risk of cancer recurrence or death. There were 12,019 patients, both in the United States and China, and they were enrolled someplace between one and five years after diagnosis. And what was evaluated was the use of vitamins A, B, C, D, and E, and multivitamins. Then they looked at recurrences and total mortality and interactions with smoking and treatment, hormonal status, etc. Um, and the results were kind of surprising even to me. Vitamin E was associated with a 12% decreased risk of recurrence, vitamin C with a 19% reduction in death, and multivitamins with a 16% decreased risk of death. Vitamin D resulting from sunlight, not supplements, hear me clearly on this, sunlight, not supplements, was associated with a 36% decreased risk of breast cancer um, for women who had had uh, estrogen positive breast cancers. That's a 36% a decreased risk of uh, breast cancer recurrence. Um, and there were no interactions, negative interactions with the supplements in chemotherapy or radiation. Um, so I'm not a fan of supplements and my reason for covering this particular study was not to encourage people to take antioxidant pills, but because I think it's better to consume these nutrients in food, but I am a fan of evidence and I just get tired of incompetent doctors giving out bad advice to particularly cancer patients. And um, in the case of cancer patients, the reason why antioxidant foods and even in some cases antioxidant supplements can be helpful is they have to strengthen their body to fight the cancer and to withstand the damaging effects of some of the treatments. Now my contention is some of the treatments they shouldn't have anyway, but um, it, it, even when the treatments are valuable, there are some risks that um, and, and side effects that can be mitigated with eating well and with some supplements. So anyway, that's piece of misinformation number one. Uh, it is, it, we do not need to avoid antioxidants during chemotherapy. Okay, the other piece of misinformation I've been talking a lot about lately is this issue of sodium restriction. And uh, I've said many times there is a very tiny subset of people who are sodium sensitive and they shouldn't consume sodium, but that should not be construed to mean that the general population should be restricting sodium, particularly to the levels recommended here in the United States. Um, a presentation made at the European Society of Cardiology 2013 um, showed that very few people will experience any benefit in terms of blood pressure uh, or hypertension as a result of restricting sodium intake. And the researchers said that taking the message of sodium restriction to the general population is not necessarily helpful or necessary. It's not necessary or helpful. So Dr. Andrew Mente from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario is the presenter. He reported that in his study of almost 100,000 people, none of the populations who were included had intake of sodium at or below the 2.3 grams recommended by most health authorities today. Um, the researchers measured sodium uh, and potassium intake using ur uh, urine excretion 
And out of these 100,000 people, here's the deal. Only 3.1% of the study subjects were consuming under 2.3 grams of sodium a day, and less than 1% were consuming less than 1.5 gram, grams per day. Um, th that's a tiny, tiny percentage of people who actually have achieved that level of sodium restriction. Uh, the researchers then looked at changes in systolic blood pressure as it relates to one gram increases in sodium consumption, and they showed that the response was only significant in tiny percentages of the people, the very elderly, people consuming more than five grams of sodium a day. Um, senior author Dr. Salim Yusuf said, quote, at lower levels, the effect, meaning sodium restriction, is so modest it isn't worth it. The study called Pure Sodium was 10 times larger than any other study examining the issue. Uh, the researchers concluded that the much more effective approach would be to target certain populations that benefit from sodium restriction, like the people who are sodium sensitive, that would be a good start. Um, and then, you know, it's important to acknowledge that this doesn't benefit most people. Almost nobody in the world is consuming um, the level of salt consumption that the American Heart Association and health authorities in our country are telling, we should, telling us we should target. He says, um, uh, Yosef, the, uh, one of the lead authors, said, um, that we're, nobody in the world is consuming the level of sodium currently recommended by health experts and the government. We're asking people to do something 99% of the population cannot and will not do. And this is his quote, from a practical point of view it makes no sense and from a scientific point of view it makes no sense. Um, and again, I want to come back to the idea, I am the first to acknowledge that there are some people who should restrict sodium, it just isn't most people. There are some people who are allergic to nuts, but it's not most people. So we can't take information that benefits a very tiny percentage of the population and translate it to the general population. And I'll tell you what, I think it's a lot easier to get people to eat the baked potatoes, the broccoli, and the rice if we let them add some salt to it. And that's the more important issue. Let's not get distracted by some of this uh, salt restriction and some of these other issues. So. That's all for now and for this week, actually. So as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might benefit, and I will be back to you again next Tuesday. Have a great day.